So hello again in this beautiful afternoon for the last talk. This is Klaas again uh, speaking. Um, there's some change here. You probably expected Michael Bartz for the uh, talk about uh, QA as we do it in OwnCloud. Unfortunately, Michael is sick at home and can't uh, give the talk, so I jumped in and um, wish Michael all the best for, for getting well soon. Um, obviously, I'm probably not that deep in the topic as Michael uh, would be, so please be patient with me if stuff goes wrong. Um, this is a talk, this talk is split between various people, so I will hand over as we move forward. But let's get started here. This is the agenda. Um, I'm talking about QA as a product feature. So yes, so first part of it is that we give you a little overview on what we are doing uh, with QA at OwnCloud. We want to take the, the quality of our product, of course, very seriously and um, decided some things around QA and quality uh, um, in, in the, all the products that we do. So here's a little overview of um, what it means that our teams work together um, to, to ensure a great uh, quality in the product. So we have various um, kind of people or, or roles contributing to, to the uh, quality that is community with all of its aspects. It's um, people from the early uh, adopters. It's uh, our engineering partners um, who, who work with us. Um, it is our very own uh, BTR team. BTR stands for Build, Test and Release Team. They actually do the, the press the, the button um, at the very end of a QA process when we, when we release a, a product. We have Young Caritech, which is a, a company in Nepal um, that has a very long um, tradition with OwnCloud and works for us for a long time already. There are more um, colleagues than uh, contributor uh, than, than um, then a company helping us um, very deeply integrated in our process uh, all over. And we have something um, in the product teams, what we call embedded QA now. Um, I will get to that in, in a minute. Um, and in addition to that, we also have some, some secret forces that ensure QA. I think everybody has it. You can't rely on that. But for example, we have Holger who has a really good intuitive way of debugging things and find each bug uh, that uh, he can find each bug that it might be in a product. Um, um, it's unbelievable. I think everybody has that. Um, and I wanted to list uh, that secret force here as well. So QA consists of reviews of automatic testing in, in the CI of unit tests. It's of course, manual testing and all that stuff. And uh, you will hear more about that later on. The end of the whole process of QA, of course, is the release of great and hopefully bug-free products. So what is embedded QA? Um, we decided to not go the old approach that you had in the 90s with having a development team that builds a product. And when that's finished, you put that into a QA team and, and test it and be done with it. And um, that has proved so much and so often to not work that we decided to see quality um, as something that has to be designed into the product from the beginning. Um, we have staffed in, in this year, we have started to staff all the product teams within uh, engineering at OwnCloud with one dedicated QA engineer. Um, and he or she is working on quality with all the other uh, contributors to QA related um, things. Um, that is still in the build up, but um, it has already turned out to be very beneficial um, uh, for the, the quality. Uh, 
a little about the QA uh, tool chain that we use at Own Cloud, um, um, split by the three uh, kinds of tests, which unit tests you might know. Unit tests are um, the most granular test. They usually are done on specific function or methods in the object-oriented world. Um, usually they don't have external dependency, but test only the, the very inside of, of, a, of a code unit. We do integration tests. Integration tests are the level above. They are usually um, testing various units together, various function groups and stuff, or even APIs. Um, and here we can have mocked components, which means that if a, if some unit or some API um, is depending on another unit that is hard to set up, for example, in a CI environment, you can do a mock, for example, for a database or for some authentication system, you just pretend to be a full-blown database, but just serving for the test what is needed. Um, that is an integration test. And finally, there are acceptance or uh, UI tests. Um, they do really the the end-to-end -end testing um, as a user would see and feel the product um, usually on an on a UI basis or depending what it can be you can probably see also an on cloud uh, server with external APIs as an as an acceptance test so this this uh, structure is not not strict people understand it differently but this is a, a kind of uh, way how we see it um, as you see in, in the lines in the on the table um, we have different technologies depending on on uh, different test technologies depending on the uh, uh, technologies that we use to to implement the solution for example mobile clients uh, we use a, a whole bunch of different tools to, to into, uh, combined into a tool chain um, that does acceptance tests for uh, the desktop clients um, <laughs> which are in, in C++, we used uh, the Qt testing uh, uh, framework for unit tests, the a very well-known toolkit called Smashbox that um, was developed uh, in with CERN's help or in the CERN actually, um, that it does integration tests on for, for the client. And the client is also tested now um, from a UI perspective with a tool called Squish. Um, that is a very um, cool tool that can actually inspect the, the Qt uh, objects of, of an application and can, you can do very, very cool automated UI tests. Uh, yeah, that is the structure. I'm not continuing to read th this all. Please bear with me because um, Arthur and Phil are now um, taking a more deep dive on what is happening on the server side. And later on, Benedict will present you what is happening on on cloud web. So with that, um, I am handing over to Arthur now. Hello, thank you, Benedict. Uh, sorry, thank you, Klaas. Um, yeah, my name is Arthur Neumann and my business partner, Phil, and I am running a company, as Klaas already mentioned, in Nepal called Jankari Tech, and we are working with OnCloud since a long time already in the area of quality assurance and especially uh, um, test automation. Yeah, thank you for giving us the time here in the, on the OnCloud conference. And we just wanted to present quickly what happened during the OSIS rewrite or when we started to develop OSIS. Because before OSIS, there has been already a good test suite for OnCloud 10 or OnCloud Classic. And because the OSIS server is supposed to be feature compatible in most cases with the OnCloud 10 server, we decided to reuse the existing API tests of OnCloud 10 and not rewrite them. We rather wanted to use the existing tests for behavior-driven development of OSIS. A similar the new web UI also should work with both OnCloud 10 and, on, and the OSIS server. 
So we made sure that the web UI test, uh, what class had it in the acceptance test list, would run the same regardless of the backend. Yeah, and so it's the beginning after some mi rather minor adjustment of the setup process, we have been able to run the API and the UI test on the OSIS backend. But at that point, OSIS had not been anywhere close to be complete. And actually for a huge part of the system, the development hadn't, hasn't even started. So obviously most tests would just simply fail because the system doesn't really even exist. So what to do? How can you run those tests and how can they handle those tests? And so of one option, one simple option would be just ignore failing tests, but that really would render the whole test suite completely useless because no one can ever remember which tests are um, already passing and which tests are known to fail. And just ignoring red CI was never a really realistic option. Another possibility was to skip tests that are known to fail. Huh? We started with that option and only ran those tests that we knew would pass with OSIS. And that way we got green CI and still prevented regressions. That was a really good start for to quickly get some test coverage for OSIS. But after a while we found it to be impractical because if our bug is fixed in OSIS or a new feature is implemented, the corresponding tests need to be enabled. So the developer would have to re-enable all appropriate tests for a new feature or run just the whole test suite, what would take for a long time and enable all tests that now suddenly start to pass. So it's possible, but it's a tedious process and would just not happen often enough in practice. And the result was that tests got enabled either too late or even not at all. And so in the next approach, we implemented a thing that we call the expected to fail list. This is actually a list of all tests that we know that will fail. So in CI, we run all tests and at the end, we compare the tests that really failed with the tests that were expected to fail. And if there is any mismatch between those two things, CI would fail. A lot of testing frameworks have even a system to mark tests to be allowed to fail. But we took that idea a step further and made sure that a test that is expected to fail would really fail. If such a test starts to pass now, in, uh, we would fail CI. And so the developer is now forced to look into the test um, and in the simplest case would we'll just delete the newly passing tests from the expected to failures list. And as soon as the test is not in the list anymore, from that point on, we would expect this test to pass in the future. So can you switch to the next slide? Yeah, so this is basically what happens. Uh, when a test need the uh, fail if it's an expected to fail list or need to pass if it's not there. And failing CI on a, on a passing test might sound really strange at first, but we found without forcing people to look at the tests, the tests would tend to be allowed to fail forever. A feature is developed, start, tests would start to pass, but because they're still allowed to fail, nobody looks at them, and then if a regression comes, nobody noticed. The tests were never adjusted. So we found we had to enforce, have a system that is more forcefully. And we found then after a while that this expected to fail list has some, some great advantages. First, it prevents regressions, obviously. Yeah? A change cannot break any other feature that used to work. And secondly, it makes sure that tests are enabled as soon as a bug is fixed or a new feature is implemented. And by that, obviously, we, imp uh, we prevent regressions for that new feature. Thirdly, it shows the state of development. 
we are doing here a rewrite of a complete software and we want to achieve future uh, feature compatibility. So how far are we? What's left to do? Simply by looking at the list of expected failures, one can easily see what still needs to be implemented or fixed. And fourth, it gives great joy to the developers. Yeah? By seeing what scenarios are fixed now and what tests are running now, the heart of the developer overflows with joy. Okay, maybe ask himself if that's true or not. Hmm? Uh, I also wrote a small blog post that explains the whole system a bit more in detail and I will share the link in the chat. But first I will hand over now to Phil who will give us a practical example and show us how that thing works in practice. Okay, hello everybody. Yeah, my name's Phil. I'm uh, actually sitting here in Nepal at the moment with a big thunderstorm around me. So if I suddenly disappear, you'll know what happened. Um, so we have, we have an expected failures file um, that we store in the repository along with the software. And for example, here we've got, um, we've got a PR in which we actually added some tests um, to the system and these were adding more test coverage and these kind of things here were these particular uh, feature files, line numbers of the scenarios in the feature file ended up having to be added to the expected failures because uh, the new better test coverage um, that we added was for things that unfortunately didn't pass yet. Um, and then this is an example of uh, what happens for um, a uh, developer who's who's working on fixing a feature and improving the software or fixing a bug or adding adding a new feature support for it. Um, so we run these these test sets back in the CS3 or Greva repository um, because actually most of the behavior of OSIS is actually uh, back in CS3 or Greva. Um, product as well, which gets um, sucked into OSIS on a regular basis. And so uh, this developer was doing some things with, fa with favorites and wrote a whole lot of code here. Um, and very nicely, they were able to remove uh, six different line numbers, six different scenarios from the expected failures file. So we can see that those started passing um, and they got this kind of report in CI, um, they could see here, we've got some unexpected past scenarios in the test run. So when they first, when they did their bug fix and ran CI, they found, oh yes, we have actually um, fixed those six scenarios and they were able to then delete them from ex the expected failures file um, and move that ahead. And then when we regularly update the um, update the Reva code into OSIS, we find this sort of thing happens. Uh, you <clears throat> update some Go Lang dependencies, and then guess what? You find that magically some scenarios start to pass. You've got some good code from Reva, and you're able to delete. Um, entries from the expected failures file. And so that's the thing that makes uh, developers happy. Uh, we've got a, some sort of tradition here um, in the team that developers are supposed to be rewarded, I think, with a, a beer for each line that they delete from the expected failures file. <laughs> um, yeah, and so in the expected failures file, we try to keep a reference to the issue concerned as well, so that you can go straight there um, to see the issue and read what it was. Um, and then you should be able to find your way to the PR that fixed it in that case. Um, that's probably enough for the amount of time that I've got. Do we want to um, move back to Arta? And I will find it. Yeah, thank uh, you, Phil. Yeah. Now that next topic that we want to talk about quickly is 
a thing that called contract-based testing. It's a very brief overview and a very brief introduction. And because of the time, I really condensed it, but I'm happy to answer more detailed questions in the QA um, channel or in a private talk. So if you think about a traditional approach of doing tests, let's say you have a provider that provides some kind of, of API. Um, in our case, this is OSIS or, or OnCloud 10. And there is some kind of consumer that uses the API. That can be a microservice or any kind of a client. And every side of the system would have some units, so hopefully you you know that the services work for for itself. Mm -hmm. And a lot of tests in OnCloud also work that that way. Mm -hmm. And to know that the services work together, what you do now is to write integration tests or or end to end tests. Mm -hmm. That is the system on cloud tests most of its infrastructure or not infrastructure of the software. But there are some issues with this traditional end to end test infrastructure. And Benedict, I think, in the next uh, talk will also uh, mention some of those. One problem is that the whole stack needs to be set up to run the tests. That's just a lot of work. You have all the dependencies, you have the database and so whatever you need to set up. It's a lot of work for to set up and maintain. Maintain. Secondly, versions of the consumer and the provider need to be maintained. So which version of the provider works with which version of the consumer? That needs to be remembered and maintained. That's, that's a maintenance effort. And thirdly, changes on one side affect the other team. If the provider team makes a change, that might affect the consumer team and vice versa. And depending who runs and where the end-to-ends are run, there mostly you will see the negative effect of a change. And of course you could run just all the tests everywhere and make sure that nothing is broken, but that takes a lot of resources and time also. So the, another approach, what you can do is contract-based testing. So at first the consumer defines how the provider expected to, re, expected to react and creates a mock provider. So now we run unit tests or unit test, unit-like tests against that mock provider and any external requests are not mocked inside of the tests like what you would usually do with unit tests, but those uh, requests are allowed to go out and to reach the mock provider. And the mock provider knows on con uh, how to react on those requests. The mock provider contains the definition of how the consumer expects the real provider to react. And that makes sure that the consumer works correctly. And then in the next step, those requests and its results of the, um, of the mock provider are written to a file, are recorded and written to a file. So the provider side then takes those recordings, the contract, and runs the request against the real provider and compares the response the real provider gives. If the response is the same, the consumer and the provider are compatible. So what happens is that each side is tested separately, but at the end we know that they should work correctly together. The advantages of that is, of this system is, of the contract-based system is, that you don't need to set up the whole stack to run the test, neither on the provider side nor on the consumer side. We're just dealing with mock services, so the real service doesn't need to be set up. Secondly, you get much quicker responses. If, for example, the provider team changes something, for example, some response, then simply running the contract will show if the client is able to deal with the change. 
you don't need to run all the end-to-end -end tests of the client to get the to get that result. Certainly, the maintenance of versions is much easier. Contracts can run against multiple versions of a consumer or a provider, and they can be tagged to show to which version the contract applies. In that way, you can maintain that um, relationship. And last, multiple consumers can be tested. If you, for example, would collect the contracts of all clients that use the API of that particular provider, for example, in on cloud case, it would be desktop, Android, web, iOS, and so on. The provider team can quickly say what is the impact of a particular change to a, and to which client, to which consumer would it, uh, which consumer is affected by that change. And so that can again be communicated back to the client teams and they can adjust accordingly. In OnCloud, we're using that system currently for testing the OnCloud Web SDK. And I hope that we can push that forward in future to other clients to yeah, use the potential of it even more. Yeah, thank you. I'm, I will go now and I will hand over to Benedict, who is also talking about the challenges of end-to-end -end tests. Thank you, Arthur. Um, so yeah, I'm Benedict Kuhlmann. You might have seen me before in the talk about accessibility. I'm not only working on that. I'm um, the team lead for the development of the new OnCloud Web UI, which is supposed to be the modern new front end for uh, both backends, OnCloud 10, uh, or now OnCloud Classic, and OnCloud Infinite Scale. And um, yeah, with that, we're sometimes facing some, some um, challenges regarding testing. So let, let me uh, tell you a little bit about the status quo or testing strategy a couple of months ago. Um, so um, yeah, really just a couple of months ago, we had um, little to, to none uh, unit and integration tests in OnCloud Web. And uh, we had and still have a huge acceptance test suite, um, which are really end-to-end -end tests um, with, with Nightwatch and Selenium testing in a browser against the real backend um, with all the challenges that Arthur just mentioned. So um, in our CI, we run um, the full acceptance test suite against an OnCloud 10 deployment with OnCloud Web as a sidecar um, against an OSIS, um, uh, instance with an integrated OnCloud web uh, service and against an OnCloud 10 with OnCloud web as an app. Um, we run that test suite on every pull request, on every merge request, a uh, merge commit, and on every release. Um, and I think if I remember correctly, Arthur once told me that running them in a sequential order would result in like 17 hours of, of uh, tests only for the for the web UI. Um, and yeah, they are highly parallelized and effectively run in like, I think 40 minutes at the moment, which is still a lot. Um, and we are facing some issues with that. So um, for one, it is quite expensive to write end-to-end um, -end tests compared to, to writing unit tests. Um, and we sometimes, with new features uh, being implemented, we face issues in, in maintaining existing end-to-end -end tests. Um, sometimes, sometimes it really even takes us uh, up to a day for fix only fixing the CI um, for our pull request, um, which is yeah too time-consuming for uh, for a high productive um, uh, software development, and. Um, with this, it, it sadly it also blocks community con uh, contributions from time to time. So um, we thought about how to improve that, and we made some de decisions. We are currently on a transi tr uh, transition journey, um, but more at the start than in the middle. Um, so at the moment, we are moving. Um, we're we're planning. We're not moving yet, but we're planning to move the acceptance tests to only run nightly. 
So this huge um, expensive block of, exp uh, of acceptance tests is supposed uh, to run nightly only. Um, and we are introducing a new set of end-to-end -end tests, um, which are uh, only smoke tests. Um, and most importantly, which have been proven as um, valuable real world user journeys. So we are very happy that, that our product management to, committed to uh, work on this with us together. Um, and in the future, we want to have our end-to-end -end tests um, yeah, really as, as real world user journeys. Um, at the same, same time, we are um, working together with Jan Caritec uh, to improve the coverage of our unit and integration tests, um, which, is, uh, which is really good by now. So in our design system, we have a coverage of uh, unit tests um, of about 80%, which is yeah, compared to like 20% um, four or five months ago, a really good job. Um, and in OnCloud Web, we're not that far yet, but the code base is, is bigger than the design system, so um, quite understandable, I guess. Um, we're at about 30% now uh, unit test coverage in OnCloud Web. And the idea is to utilize these yeah, cheaper um, tests, unit tests and integration tests, um, more than, than we did so far. And the goal with that is pretty simple. So um, at the moment we have um, because it's quite hard for developers to, to implement new end-to-end -end tests. Um, and we fully trust and, and need uh, and carry tech to, to do that for us. And, but basically after feature development, and that is not the idea, um, it is quite hard to get fully automated releases because we have a release process every three weeks. And um, as part of that release process, we want to have testing. Um, the, the full acceptance test suite covers, already covers that what we had before is still working so that regressions are hopefully non-existent. Um, but for the new features, uh, we're never sure if um, our, our um, ECI covers everything that we implemented in the current sprint. And because of that, we, we still have um, manual testing involved in every release, which is again, time consuming um, and we would like to gain yeah, trust in, in fully automated releases together with, um, yeah, with, with the requirement of writing unit tests and integration tests in, in all pull requests. Um, and um, yeah, by introducing a hopefully easier to use um, smoke test suite. And the last but not least point is we want to be more approachable for, for community again which um, is hopefully the case by only requiring unit and integration tests. Yeah, I think that's the most important part of the testing strategy of OnCloud Web for the very near future. Um, and with that, yeah, thank you for your, for your attention. Happy to get questions. <laughs>